the queue capacity is two, we have some space for that. We start this, oh, sorry, we added the first element, we added the second element. And when adding the third element, we exceed the queue capacity, so we cannot do that. And this uh, offer fails. And the last call extracts the first element. So we clearly see that this execution is correct. What about this one? Now we have th 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 three offers. All of them succeed. Is it correct? OK. So who thinks it's not? Everyone. So you see, it's, it's very clear when we live in the sequential world. Indeed, it's incorrect because uh, uh, the last offer must fail with the queue capacity equals 2. But how, how to understand whether a concurrent execution is correct or not? With, with, the, uh, with concurrency, you have multiple threads. And this the th th threads may interleave in many different ways. And still, we need to somehow decide whether something is correct or incorrect. And uh, when we talk about concurrent algorithms, when we say that the th 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 thread safe, atomic, correct, we usually mean that they are linearizable. That's the default correctness condition for concurrent algorithms. And now we'll, we'll dive into this uh, uh, condition. So we say that some execution, concurrent execution is linearizable. If we can find a sequential execution that uh, produces the same results, con consistent of the same operations, of course, and uh, doesn't violate the happens before order. So it doesn't violate the program order in each of the threads and doesn't violate the synchronization between threads. And if we can find such, such a sequential execution, if we can explain our current results with some sequential execution, then we say that these results are linearizable. And if all possible, uh, uh, in all possible scenarios, the results are linearizable, then we say that the data structure is linearizable. So, I know that it's hard to catch it from this definition. That's why we have several examples. So here we have two threads. We still have a bounded queue of capacity 2. And in the first thread, we add element 1 and we extract 1. In the second thread, we add 2 and extract 2. So is this execution correct? Can we find a sequential execution that doesn't violate the program order, doesn't violate synchronization, we have no synchronization here, that will end with the same results. So who thinks we can find such an execution? Who found it? Who didn't? OK. So, so we, we now we, we need to explain these results with some sequential execution. So, for example, we can say that uh, the first thread was uh, executed first, then the execution switches to the second thread and finishes. So we do not violate the program order here, right? So the order uh, in each of the threads remains the same. We don't violate the synchronization between threads because there was no synchronization between threads. And we can explain these results. It means that the original execution is linearizable. All right, another example. Now in the first thread, we add one and extract two. And in the second thread, we add two and extract one. So can we find uh, uh, a sequential execution that explains these results? So, so I see some hands. OK. Who thinks uh, that these results are incorrect? Oh, also some hands. So, so let's try to find 
uh, such execution first. And what we can do is to start with the first thread, add one into the queue, then we switch to the second thread. We add two, then we call Paul, which extracts one, right? And then we go back to the first thread and extract, and extract two. So here we explained our, uh, our results with this sequence of operations. So it's linearizable. All right, one more example. Here it gets a little bit more tricky. The difference is that uh, in the second thread, uh, we first add two, then we add to three, we add it successfully, and then we extract one. So let's spend some time trying to, 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 to understand to whether it's correct, trying to find an execution that explains these results. So have we even found an execution? Oh, I see even more hands than last time. Uh, so who thinks it's incorrect that, that it's impossible to find such an execution? All right. So uh, actually, I don't remember. Let's click on the next slide. Yeah, actually, we can find one. We still can find it. Let's say we start from the second thread. Right, so we add two, then we switch to the first thread, so we, we add one, the capacity is not exceeded yet, then we extract the first element, which was two, right? So everything is fine so far, then we switch to the second thread, we add one more element, so now it, it contains only one, then we add one more element, we don't exceed the capacity, so everything's fine, and then we extract one. So we can still can find uh, a sequential execution that explains these results. That's why it's linearizable. Because if we go back and take a look, it's really hard to understand without knowing what linearizability is, whether it's fine or not, right? But the intuition that you can explain it with this uh, uh, sequential execution. It's correct. You cannot. It's incorrect. OK, the last example. Last one. So in the first thread, we add 1 and two, extract 2. The second thread, we add 2 and 3 and extract 3. Let's try to find a sequential uh, explanation of this execution. I know it's hot, it's still morning. So let's vote. So who thinks it's correct? Who f did find sequential execution? So who thinks it's incorrect? Who thinks it's impossible to build sequential execution? OK, it's, it's actually it's impossible. Um, the qu good question is why? 
ภาพอืมว้าวว่าทุกมิ่นดิสฟานว่าส์ว่าท์ดีพรีเวียสอุปสมบัติว่าพิเศษว่าทุกมิ่นว่าพรีเวียสอุปสมบัติเราจะพูดคุยว่าที่ปัจจุบันโอเคนี่คือคำถามใช่ไหมใช่ใช่ฮิตเดอะคำถามเกี่ยวกับเมื่อคำถามแต่เมื่อคำถามเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเราพบว่าเรา So now, after that, we have only element one in the queue. Do you agree? Why? Then we add three. So we have one and three. One is first, th 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 three is the second element, and then we extract the first element. It's okay. a it's a first in first out queue. Okay, my bad. <laughs> But here the problem is that, let's say, let's say that this poll, the last poll. It must return three. The only way to do that, the only way to do that, uh, is to call offer one after this poll, right? Because we have only two polls. The last sh should return three, and we have two offers be before this poll. And we need to extract an element from the second offer. So we need to call offer two, offer three. Then pull. Uh, then we need to pull some somehow and call poll three. But in this case, to call another poll in between offer three and the poll in the second thread, we need to execute the first thread in between. But if we do that, then this offer one in the first thread it fails because the the, the queue capacity. Is two, and we cannot uh, have more than two elements, so that we cannot uh, find a sequential execution that explains these results. It's impossible. So this execution is not linearizable, so it's incorrect, and it means that the current data structure implementation is also incorrect. So, oops. Okay, so I hope now you have some intuition of on uh, what the usability is, what we expect from a concurrent algorithm. Uh, let's now try to test it. And usually, when you write a concurrent test, you write some stress test, uh, which covers uh, uh, which covers only easy to verify scenarios. Like you have a queue, you run two threads, one n q n elements, another d q n elements, and you simply check that you do not violate the first in first out order. You well, you check that you transferred all the elements successfully. But it's hard to to test such scenarios with the stress tests because they're very hard to verify. And also, when you run, uh, when you write a concurrent stress test, you have a lot of boilerplate code. You need to manually run threads. You need to uh, 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 to write a lot of uh, uh, verification logic. And okay, sometimes it's okay, no problem. But let's say you have you have a very well quality stress test, and you don't care about boilerplate. Okay, and then it fails. What are you gonna do with that? So you you have a scenario of one uh, hundred operations, and you know that some assert has failed after that, and you need to debug that. You have a concurrent test, which is even hard to reproduce. It's non-deterministic because today the th threads seem to live this way. And next time, they interleave another way. So you can't 
debug it with a debugger, you you just have different results, uh, different interleavings each of the time, and you need to debug that somehow. That's actually very hard. So ideally, we need some framework that can help us not only with the writing tests, but also with the debugging their errors. Let's, uh, let's try to build such a framework. So if I were building one, uh, I would first of all have some class, uh, test class for my bounded QAI, and start with uh, specifying the initial state of my tested data structure. So here we create a new bounded QEI of capacity 2. Then what I want is to simply list the operations, right? To say, OK, I have this data structure. I have offer and poll operations, which I want to test. And run some magic button. That's the API I want. I don't want to explain how to test this data structure. I want the API to be declarative. I want to declare the initial state of the data structure. I want to declare the operations and ask the framework to do the rest. And that's exactly what we do in LinCheck. The only difference is that instead of this run concurrent test, we have a specific API. For example, to run a stress test, we create new stress options which we can conf so we can configure the test and we call check. And if we run this test, this test fails with an error, with a small one. So it's not like you have a hundred of uh, operations. No, you have t two threads, two operations in one thread, and uh, uh, one operation in the second one. And it says that, OK, I found uh, an error on this scenario with the incorrect results. So uh, we clearly see here that we have a queue of capacity 2, but all this offer has succeeded. So one of the offers has exceeded the capacity. Right? One of these offers must fail, because we cannot have th 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 three elements in a queue of capacity 2. So that's the output we get. But how has Incheck found this error? How has he found this scenario? So let's briefly, uh, let me briefly explain how Incheck works. So when you list all these operations, it generates a lot of concurrent uh, uh, scenarios, putting these operations in uh, different threads and generating arguments for these operations uh, uh, as well. And then, each of these uh, concurrent scenarios, uh, we examine. So with the stress testing, we run this, uh, uh, the same scenario many, many times in hope to cut a bug. If you, for, exam for example, have some uh, assertions in the code and uh, uh, an operation throws an assertion error, we can easily say, OK, we found an error. But usually, usually operations finish successfully, so we have some results, like in our example. We have offers, and all of them succeeded. And now we need to understand whether these results are correct or incorrect. And this is the last phase. So the check tries to automatically explain whether the outcome results are correct by uh, finding a sequential execution that explains these results. So you see, you have this code. You have your concurrent code. And uh, what instability means, what correctness means, is that you can find a sequential uh, execution that explains the results. So that's what InCheck does. It runs your code sequentially and tries to find the execution that will explain your concurrent results. Of course, you can specify another implementation for this part, so you have kind of an oracle-based testing. But still, it remains very simple, so you don't need to, uh, uh, to explain the semantics uh, 
uh, of your tested data structure in a different language now. You just have your implementation. Or you can provide a simple implementation if you wish. So, to sum up, in check takes a list of operations, then generates many concurrent scenarios, studies them, verify operation results on each scenario run. And that's how we uh, got this error. But here is a question. Okay, now we have this error. It's small, that's good, but how to analyze it? How to understand what happened? How, we, how did we get into this situation? For that we need more data. It's not enough to have only the scenario. We need more data, such as an interleaving trace. We need to know the events that happened in each of the threads to really understand the root cause of the error. So for that in LinCheck, we have not only stress testing, we also have a model checker uh, that controls the execution. So it controls how you uh, switch from one thread to another thread. So it remembers what happened and can provide you this specific trace that leads to the error. So if we now replace test options with model checking options here and rerun the test, then we have not only the scenario, we also have a trace that explains these results. So let's zoom, zoom in this. So yeah, so here's the trace. I simplified it a little bit, so I moved to uh, the uh, code locations. Uh, so it's, it's very simple now. So this is the trace, which explains what happened in the data structure. So here we see that we started with the, uh, the second thread. We first reach size, we go to the queue, then we switch. We call two offers, and then we switch back and finish the execution. So let's try to analyze this trace now. How to analyze it? Okay, we need the source code, right? So we can see what's happening. And let's also visualize the current state of our bounded queue implemented by AI. So initially, the queue is empty, size is zero. Here's the offer implementation. And to uh, the execution tracks. So we start from the uh, the second thread. So offer first checks that uh, it doesn't exceed the capacity, so it reads uh, the size counter. So here we read size. Size is zero. Capacity is two. No problem. We uh, we, we don't finish here. And we go into the underlying uh, uh, concurrent queue and uh, uh, offer one there. So now the queue contains one, and the size is still zero. And we are about to increment the size in this second thread. But we don't do that now. We switch the execution to the first thread. So we now switch the execution, and uh, we call offer in the first thread. So this offer adds one more element to the queue, and also increments the size. So the size was zero, so we do not ex exceed the capacity, right? So we successfully add a new element. And when adding one more element, you see the size is one. So when we, if we check now, whether we have free space in this queue? Yes, we do. The queue capacity is two, the size is one. So the next offer in the first thread also succeeds. And here is the problem, you see. So now the size is two, no, fine. But in the queue, we have not two, but 30 elements. And if you now 
uh, switch back to the sec to the second thread. Then only now we increment the size. And define others that we we added an element. That's how we uh, inserted three elements into the queue of capacity two. And when we have such a trace, so yeah, we, here we finish. And we, uh, when we have such a trace, it's easy to debug the error. It's easy to analyze it and to understand the root cause. And here the root cause is simple. So when we uh, over the element, we need to somehow atomically increment the size. And if we do that dot atomically, then it's possible that another threads, another operation is called in between the uh, adding uh, an element into the queue and incrementing the size. And we can add more uh, elements than the queue capacity. So we've just easily investigated the root cause of this error. And it would be much harder to do that without having a trace. And uh, for us, when working on concurrent algorithms, the model checker was a game changer. So we had a particular business reason, actually for implementing such functionality. So I was working for new, uh, on new concurrent algorithms for code and coroutines, and we were stuck with bugs. I mean, you try to develop something, it doesn't work, the test fails, and then you spend days or sometimes a week trying to understand what has just happened. So we needed to implement a model check to proceed, and only after we added this functionality, we successfully developed n new algorithms. And it also changed how we worked on developing new algorithms. Because without this, usually when you, you have a hypothesis, and you want to check whether it works or not, you think a lot about it. You try to find all the current cases. You think about all of that, but now you, you don't do that. Because often it's much easier to implement your idea rather than thinking about it. So instead of uh, thinking about it, you, impl you implement it, run a test, understand why it's wrong, improve your intuition, and start again. And it changes the way you implement the algorithms. Okay, so that's what you get with the lean check. But how did it get this trace? And to construct this trace, well, we need to instrument bytecode. So here is a simple uh, uh, example. So we have not a queue, but simply data structure. We have a counter, and we want it to be concurrent. And here, obviously, it's not. So we have an increment and get function, and uh, uh, so here we increment the value and return it. And if we compile uh, this uh, uh, function, then we see that it uh, reads the value, then it uh, locally uh, increments it, then it writes a new uh, value, and then it reads, reads it again. So we have get field, put field, get field. These are the events we are interested in, because when we deal with concurrency, we don't care about local computations. We care about the events then, uh, that can be seen by other threads. So we need to analyze reads, writes, compare and sets, uh, log acquisitions and releases and such other events. And uh, that's what we do with the lean check. We try to uh, add our analysis before uh, all these bytecode instructions. So for example, here we insert uh, lean check functions indicating that now we're going to read something and then we're going to write something. 
and then we're going to re reach something again. And each time we pass through this function, it decides whether to, to continue the execution on the current thread or switch to another one. So for example, if we write a test for this counter, so here's the Linchak test, and we run it, then it fails with the very specific execution. So with this execution, like we start with the second th thread, we read the count, we perform increment and get in the first thread, and we go back to the second thread. As we, we write zero, then we write one because we think it's zero. And to generate this execution, remember we had all these read and write f uh, calls uh, uh, b b b before the read and write instructions. And uh, here, when we st started with the second thread, before reading uh, the value, we, we asked in check whether we need to continue or not. And uh, here we continue. But then, uh, oh, so sorry, it should be right to switch. Ah, my gosh. So, but then, but, 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 but then before uh, performing the write, we decided to switch to the first thread. Then it was continue, continue, continue. Then we go back and finish the execution. So that's how the check works internally. That's how the, uh, we trace all the events internally. So there is no magic, just bad code instrumentation. So cool, isn't it? So you write 10 lines of code. You don't need to specify how to test your data structure. You just uh, uh, declare your data structure run some magic button, and you get a small example on, on, on which your data structure fails with the, a very detailed interleaving. But how did we analyze the trace? When analyzing the trace, we did the first event, then we draw the data structure state, right? Then we did the next event. Then we update the data structure state. And then the next event. And then we draw it again. Sometimes from scratch, because we have this uh, piece of paper and we cannot uh, 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 <coughs> and we cannot update it for uh, infinitely. We sometimes we just don't have space to withdraw the structure set again and again and again. And it's so frustrating. Why are we doing this? What we are actually doing here is we are playing the debugger role. We are trying to debug this execution. So how can we improve the user experience here? So we were we wanted to make it uh, better. And to, for that, we developed uh, an integer plugin that actually utilizes the debugger to, to display the current state and draw the current data structure. And if you run a model checker test, you see not only the output, there's also the investigating debug mode to big button. If you uh, press it, we can uh, now debug this into living. So for that, of course, you need to install the plugin. It's not bundled by default yet. And let me show you how it works. So, oh, where is my integer idea? Where is it? Oh, it's here. Okay, do you see it? Should I increase the font size? No? Okay. Increase the font size in all editors. Is it better now? Okay, so we now we we have these buttons. When we press it, run the test, 
test now in debug mode, so it will take you know, five seconds. Yeah. And here what we have. So we have our oh, it's a little bit small. I, I thought it's going to be full screen, I mean. <laughs> the presentation. OK. So we have this scenario. And it's the same scenario is like we have offer one here, then we start another offer. We switch uh, to the first thread, and then we switch back. And you can s stop at the beginning of each of the blocks. And you see that the data structure state also changes. It's on the right. And you can go forward, you can go backward, or if you're interested in more details, we have all the details here in the interleaving trace. So you can pause at any place and have your data search visualized. And uh, you actually stop in the debugger so you, you uh, can observe the current state check all the local variables, so you, you have all the information to debug this chase. That is how it works. And uh, it actually helps a lot, especially when uh, uh, we debug complex algorithms, when this data structure is, uh, uh, is not that simple, and uh, when learning new algorithms, because you can easily understand your bugs because most people uh, prefer uh, visual content rather than uh, just text and me too and uh, uh, our experience shows that with this uh, functionality you can quickly l uh, learn new things so Let's go back to the slides. So that was the demo. So to sum up. So if you want to test concurrent algorithm, please use LinCheck. Because it's very easy to use. You don't need to, to, to learn the API. It's very straightforward. You can even ask the AI system to, to write a LinCheck link check test, and it will do so. And uh, within check, you have solid tests and great debugging experience. And I hope that one day AI will generate correct concurrent code. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have a couple of minutes for the questions. So, is there anyone with microphone? Ah, so... How many sequential permutations do you generate with uh, LinCheck? Oh, that's a good question. So, uh, LinCheck doesn't generate all the sequential executions. It tries uh, to build them lazily. So, it's like you have... Uh, let's say you have two threads. You can start with one or another. You try to start with, with, with the first one, and you can immediately observe that uh, the, the, the results are already incorrect, so you don't go to, uh, to this path, then you uh, investigate the second option. And then you lazily uh, uh, find, uh, kind of lazily generate uh, sequential execution. Uh, the, this approach is exponential, of course, but in practice, it works pretty good. So no performance issues so far with the verification phase. So I think we need to pass the microphone. So LinCheck will go through all options. If you have like, let's say more threads, more capacity, it's not going to miss any like very low percentage error. It's going to like cover all scenarios, and then every time it's gonna. Okay, like so if there is a low percentage. It's gonna show it every time. 
Okay, so I'll check the testing framework. If the test passes, it doesn't mean that your data structure is correct. But it, it's likely correct. So it's, it's the best uh, way to test uh, a concurrent data structure you have. In our experience, if you, if you examine uh, 200 scenarios and uh, 10 or 20,000 interlinks for each of them, it's, an, it's enough. So we, uh, we didn't find errors on uh, more, more scenarios and more interlinks. But it doesn't guarantee you anything. For example, you have a bug uh, related to uh, an integer overflow, and you cannot detect it with uh, this approach. You need another one. But usually it's, you have uh, such a bug in the sequential execution as well. I, I don't know how it helped in this case. <laughs> we need uh, some way to prove uh, that the data structure is correct, but that's, uh, 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 that would cost a lot. I mean, uh, usually you need to write these proofs, and we don't want to. It's, it's easy to write a test. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So, to my understanding, when a situation fails in the stress test, the uh, lean check starts to brute force all the possible uh, execution paths that uh, might have led to this error. Does that mean that the execution time of the test uh, increases exponentially with the complexity of the tested method? Okay, so we have two options. We have, uh, uh, you can use stress testing, so you really run these threads and try to hit an incorrect execution. And we have model check. Right now, you choose either one option or another one. We, we, we will soon uh, uh, merge a pull request that runs a model check test if the stress test fails, because it makes sense, of course, because usually you can explain these results. But right now, you choose either one option or another one. And uh, it's still that. We still do not try to uh, uh, to, to, to explore or, or interlinks until we find the error. We we have some bound. So if we cannot, okay, we cannot do anything about that because it's better to say that we cannot find an interlink if we, we try if we have an error in test test and we try to. Uh, explain it with the model check. It's better to say that we cannot find uh, uh, an incorrect interleaving rather than uh, running the test for one hour. That's not what you want uh, on your CI. Okay, thank you. So I think we ran out of time. So thank you all and see you around.